right, I have that it's 10 o'clock. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Hope everybody can hear me okay. I was trying to figure out, see if I could send you the PDF of the handout on Zoom, but I could not figure out a way to do it. So we're just gonna go ahead and move forward with it. I am gonna show it to you really quick before we get going. Actually, I'll we'll do introductions first, that would be better. Um, welcome to Brain Health, it's a no-brainer. Um, my name is Chelsea Byers Gerstenecker, and my colleague is um, Molly Hofer. Um, a little bit about us. Um, we developed this three part program, um, and it looks at the aging brain, memory, and lifestyle factors that contribute to brain health. Um, you know, a little bit about myself um, I spent five and a half years as an activity therapist on an Alzheimer's unit before getting my master's in gerontology. I spent a couple of years working for the Alzheimer's Association in St. Louis, and I have worked for U of I Extension now for 11 years. Um, the brain health programs are one of our most requested programs here throughout the state of Illinois. Um, and I really enjoy teaching them. And Molly and I have recently updated the research on these programs. Um, Molly, I'll pass it over to you. Hi everyone, my name is Molly, as Chelsea mentioned. I am also a family life educator with the University of Illinois Extension. I work up in Cook County, Chicago area, and uh, my background is also gerontology, just like Chelsea. Prior to working in Extension, I worked in um, community-based hospital programs, as well as long-term care. I worked for Cook County Hospital um, as a rec therapist also a long time ago. I've worked for Extension for 26 years uh, and have taught about aging in the context of family for that entire time mostly. So um, Chelsea and I have a wonderful um, love for teaching older adults and specifically about teaching brain health. And if we could just have kind of everybody send um, us kind of a shout out on the group chat where, what states you guys are from, we would really appreciate that. So um, let us kind of know where you're from. Your names will pop up in the chat box, but let us know like who's here, where you're from. Um, we'd really appreciate that. Um, while you're doing that, I am going to switch screens for just a moment and share, um, flip through our, um, handout that you guys do not have. Um, just give me a minute to share. Can you see the handout, Molly? Yes, I can. Okay. So, um, Here's what the handout uh, looks like. So we will be doing some activities throughout the course of the session. Um, so if you have paper and pen to do the activities with us, um, as we go along um, through the different brain health contributors, uh, we leave space in the handout for taking notes to do the activity. And then after each session, there is a place where we have participants kind of do an assessment of that brain health contributor. So what are they currently doing um, in, you know, to contribute to that? Like, their sleep assessment, and then, you know, what do they want to work on? Um, you know, are they doing okay in that area? You know, do they want to work on that area? So each area we have, um, we go through, we have a note section, an activity, and then a little assessment at the end of each activity. So they can kind of check in on how they're doing and if they want to um, improve in that area, because each of these go towards um, brain health. So I'm just going to kind of flip through it um, so you would see what that handout looks like. Um, because you don't have it in front of you. <laughs> so now we'll go back to the PowerPoint and get into our program. All right. If you have any questions, feel free to um, put them in the chat box. Um, if it's something that we want to uh, address right away, um, Molly or I will kind of interrupt each other and address it. If it's something that we want to kind of table to the end of the session, um, we will take notes of it and um, address it later. So don't think that we're ignoring you. 
All right. So Headstrong, um, initially we were going to kind of jump in with FitWits, but we're going to hold that off. We're going to jump in today with Headstrong. Um, Headstrong is about... Um, Are you trying to advance the slide shelves? No, I'm just going to see. Somebody was there. You go. Got it. All right. So when we're small, it's not uncommon for grown-ups to say things like eat your vegetables, finish your homework, um, then you can watch TV or go outside and play. Um, eight o'clock is bedtime. Um, as children, we typically obey the rules that adults set for us. Little did we know that these golden rules are actually factors that contribute to brain health throughout our life. This workshop helps us to understand what we can and should do to support the health of our brains and our bodies. So let's get started by looking at our objectives. All right, today we're going to learn about brain health contributors that can be helpful at any age, assess personal lifestyle choices that contribute to brain health for good or for bad, and then create a lifestyle plan that promotes behaviors that positively influence brain health. So healthy brains benefit from getting good and enough sleep, eating a heart healthy diet, exercising regularly, managing your stress, having social and emotional support, stimulating your brain with a variety of new and increasing levels of challenging activities. It's best not to focus solely on any one of these lifestyle factors because all of them should be done in combination for optimal benefits. Now we're gonna go through each of these individually. All right, sleep affects both our mental and physical health. Adults need an average of seven to eight hours of sleep every night. Sleep helps you think and focus better. It also can influence your mood. Have you ever taken care of a cranky baby? Or in my case, a cranky teenager? <laughs> Everybody needs um, a good night's sleep. Everyone experiences a poor night's sleep once in a while, and it can impact how we feel the next day. We may feel tired, irritable, or a bit out of sorts. Here are some things to try to get a good night's rest. Keep a sleep schedule, go to bed the same time each night, and get up at the same time each morning. And this is all days of the week, so not just like during your work schedule, it's, it's every day. Make the environment dark, quiet, and comfortable. Avoid exercise within three hours of your bedtime. Limit the use of electronics before bed, and no electronics in your bedroom, including the TV. Relax before bedtime. Um, maybe try a warm bath or a reading to settle you into the night. Avoid alcohol and caffeine late in the day. Quiet the mind by writing concerns on a piece of paper. And consult a doctor if there are any ongoing sleep problems. So now I have a little activity for everybody. Um, I'm just going to give you a moment or two to think about these. So on a piece of scrap paper, I want you to try to identify as many idioms as you can in one minute. So things like hit the sack. So kind of sayings that have to do with sleep. Just take a moment and try to do that. We're trying to get your brain moving.
All right, hopefully everybody got a chance to do that. I realize that you said, uh, I think somebody said I, you could see my top of my file cabinet. So thank you. <laughs> I didn't know my video was on, appreciate that. All right, so what kind of things did you guys think of? And besides hit the sack, you wanna say them out loud or type them in the chat. Crash. Hit the hay. And if everybody will mute themselves, I hear a lot of um, rustling of papers. Go to bed with the chickens. I've never heard that one. Snooze, if you, you snooze, you lose. Catch some Z's. Don't let the bed bugs bite. Fluff like a baby. Dead to the world. Bitey night. Ni oh, 99, I bet. Got it. These are great. Good night. Sleep tight. Awesome. Sawing. Yeah, he was sawing. Z's. Good ones. Awesome. Um, so now we're going to go ahead um, and move on to the next one. Keep typing those in if you have them. In a session, we would have people fill out their sleep assessment. All right. Now moving on to eating a heart healthy diet. It's really important that if you eat a heart healthy diet, you're eating a brain healthy diet. So all the research points to that. Heart healthy is brain healthy. So things to think about is focus on lean meat, poultry, fish, limited red meat, low fat dairy, limit your sodium and added sugar, uh, choose healthy fats, foods with uh, mono, mon, mono unsaturated and polyunsaturated fats, um, things like nuts, fish, things that are rich in omega-3 fatty acids like salmon, trout, albacore tuna, sardines, anchovies, shrimp, your flaxseed oil, canola oil, olive oil, walnuts, um, drink alcohol in moderation, uh, drink lots of water to stay hydrated, um, choose foods that are rich in antioxidants, so your berries, your citrus fruit, Dark leafy greens, grapes, broccoli, cabbage, carrots, um, sweet potatoes, dried uh, beans, nuts, red wine, tea, and whole grains. Um, now we're going to do an activity. This one's going to be pretty difficult for you guys since you don't have the handout, but maybe you can identify some of them while you're looking at the screen. Um, we're looking for these words that are on the right. Um, try to find some of these um, while you're looking at your computer screens. Um, in the word fine, see how you do. And there's also three hidden words in here that are not on the list. So here's another little brain challenge for you. So this is just gonna be good for you for a moment. I'm just gonna give you a couple minutes for this one. When we do this with our participants, we do give them maybe only two to three minutes so that they are working against the clock because working against the clock is uh, good for the brain. It helps you focus. You have your full attention and focus on the activity. So um, we would normally do this against the clock and whatever um, a person finishes in that time frame is good enough. All right, not to ruin the fun, but I'm gonna show you where all the answers are. So the three hidden ones are um, nuts, water, and spinach. Those were not listed. All right, so hopefully you found some of those words. Okay, now we're gonna move on to exercise. So give your brain a boost by get, getting moving. So the exercise is really good for your brain. One of the most renowned researchers in the area of exercise and brain health is Dr. Art Kramer. 
he used to work here at U of I, and he was the director of the Beckman Institute for Advanced Science and Technology. He was recently moved out to the East Coast, though. In an interview, he was asked to identify two to three lifestyle habits that people can do to improve their brain health. His reply in this interview was, be active by engaging in 30 to 60 minutes of aerobic activity at minimum three days a week, participate in intellectual activities, and engage in social interaction. And for optimal benefit, combine all three. He said, why not take a walk with your friends and discuss a good book? In his research, Dr. Art Kramer found that subjects who participated regularly in aerobic exercise demonstrated increase in brain volume and improvements in cognitive function in follow-up tests compared to the non-aerobic exercise group. When thinking about what kind of physical activity and how much, it's pretty simple. Exper experts recommend minimally 30 minutes or more three times a week. Aerobic exercise raises your heart rate and breathing rates. This can be activities that you enjoy, such as jogging, biking, or swimming. Simply walk at your regular pace has been found to be more beneficial than not doing anything. Activities that engage your body and the mind socially with a purpose can have even more of a brain impact. Possible activities include things like dancing, ping pong, group activity classes that have a social component. Exercise improves brain function by protecting against nerve cell death, promoting new neurons in the hippocampus, part of the brain where memories are formed, increasing your reaction time, improving concentration, and increasing the ability to focus and ignore non-essential stimuli. Maintaining and building neural connections and pathways, which is critical for our neurons to communicate, and increasing the blood flow to the brain. And of course, that's important because your brain needs that oxygen. It decreases the chances of having a damaging health condition, such as diabetes or heart disease. Um, and then it's always good to check in with your doctor if you plan to start any new exercise program or increase your difficulty. Um, so now we're going to do a little brain health activity that has to do exercise. So now what we want you to do is to try to think about as many words you can that end in OG, that end in IM, and that end in KE. So for example, like something that ends in OG could be blog. So try to think of as many words as you can that end in the last two letters of each of these words. I'm just going to give you a couple minutes here to brainstorm some of these. I don't know if anybody's competitive, but Molly has like 28 here for jog.
24 for swim. And 27 for bike. To count up how many you guys thought of, she might have had a little bit more time to think about this though. Just for fun, I'll read you guys some things that she thought of for uh, these answers, for possible answers. So for Indian and OG, he has bog, grog, hog, hog, flog, frog, log, hog, dog, nog, flog, agog, or blog, sorry, agog, flog, uh, analog, dialogue, black, Backlog, bulldog, catalog, bullfrog, eggnog, hedgehog, unclog, sea dog, sea frog, polywog, sea dog, waterlog, epilogue. Now you can see why I like to work with her. She's pretty creative. For swim, she has grim, prim, dim, rim, him, brim, prim, slim, Whim, shim, skim, vim, aim, acclaim, exclaim, denim, victim, interim, pilgrim, reclaim, verbatim, quick claim, and counterclaim. And for bike, hope, puke, like, mike, duke, joke, bake, yoke, make, Wake, take, broke, revoke, intake, unlike, broke, alike, ache, folk, wake, fake, fake, hike, break, juke, take, reboot, juke, oh, sorry, Molly, you had even more words than I thought, remake, strike, stake, smoke, awake, flake, choke, snake, Fluke, awoke, evoke, bike, earthquake, cheesecake, now you're talking, backstroke, heat stroke, and downstroke. All right, I guess I should have been doing some of these assessments as we um, have been going through them because with the participants, things that we would ask next then after doing this activity would be, as far as exercise goes, what are some things you like to do? So this would be in their packet. I'm going to put this out to you guys if you want to check put this into your chat box. What are some things you guys like to do for exercise? Some things that people can choose from in their packet are walk, jog, bike, swim, garden, dance, strengthen and tone, lift weights, and then we have um, some spaces to, um, you can write in other things. But go ahead and share some things that you enjoy doing. Ah, kayak. I love kayaking. Oh, very good. Water aerobics, walking, biking, Zumba, lifting weights. Yes, walking. And then part of the assessment for this one is um, for people to think about um, after we talk about, you know, getting a minimum three days of activity, minimum 30 minutes, clearly that's at minimum. Um, we ask people to think about the amount of exercise they get per week um, to kind of do a little self-assessment of, you know, are they getting enough, not enough, a little bit, but I could get more, just the right amount. So people can, you know, kind of self-assess themselves and then, you know, based on their exercise assessment, they will, you know, A, keep their current ex exercise routine as it is working for them, try to exercise more than they currently do, or discuss their exercise plan with their doctor. Um, and I'm sorry I didn't do that with the sleep one and the um, food one. I should have done that with you guys since you aren't looking at the uh, handout. Just so you guys can know kind of what that looks like for everybody. Um, so, 
All right. Okay. Now we're going to turn it over to Molly, who's going to go through the next contributor. Thank you, Chelsea. Uh, the next contributor, as you can see by now, all of these contributors are things that most of us do every day to occasionally, back to every day. Uh, we, these are normal everyday activities that we try to make part of our lives. Sometimes we're more successful than others. So the next contributing factor that uh, we'll talk about is managing our stress. And I think it's safe to assume that everyone listening today has some stress in your lives. Uh, you probably have experienced a little bit of stress even uh, thus far today, maybe in traffic getting to your job, or you might be concerned about someone you love, so thoughts keep coming into your head about that person and you're, and you're a little bit worried. So we cannot escape stress in our lives. We do have positive and negative stressors, um, a positive stressor uh, might be something, you might be anticipating the birth of a child or a grandchild or a nice vacation might be coming up, but you're still stressing over, did I, did I do this? Did I do that? I still have to cancel the mail. I still have to do all kinds of things. So uh, even though we're excited about something, we still experience stress. Another example of a positive stressor might be, um, or physical thing, things that you might experience if you've ever had sweaty palms before you were supposed to do something important or if you've had those butterflies in your stomach. Those are all uh, signs of stress, but they are also motivators. If you have to make a toast at a wedding, you're motivated to make that toast. You do have that little energy boost right before you make that toast. So we all need some stress in our lives to motivate us, but Obviously, too much stress or prolonged stress is absolutely not good for us. Research has demonstrated that chronic stress like that, like prolonged stress, can create long-term changes in the structure and function of the brain. So if we don't manage our stress, it is absolutely not good for our bodies and, of course, not good for our brains. We are all one person after all. And another study conducted by Dr. Rahida Sina at Yale University in her research, she showed that exposure to chronic stress can reduce brain volume. So when I talk about changes in the structure of the brain, a reduction in brain volume is one of those changes that are noticed. And this can imp impact thinking, it can impact emotion regulation. Other studies have demonstrated that prolonged stress can contribute to destruction of brain cells over time and can slow down the growth of new neurons, to slow down the, no the growth of new cells. So it's, um, it's very important to manage our stress. Another researcher I'd like to talk about, and I just love his book, Dr. Robert Sapolsky. He is a professor of neurology at Stanford. He authored the book, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. Love the title. But in this book, he talks about stress and the human response and compares it to animal response, other mammals like zebras and lions. Now, when a zebra is stalked by a lion, what is it doing? When a zebra knows a lion is, is near and, you know, I. I don't know animal language, but when the zebra knows the lion is near, of course, the ze I imagine the zebra's heart is pounding, it's reacting. It must initiate a stress response in order to survive, in order to move, in order to have any chance of living. Now, a human response differs from animals who are able to react to the immediate crisis. And when it's over, if they've survived, they carry on business as usual. They walk along and, and resume normalcy. Humans are different. Humans have the ability to be chronically stressed by their own thoughts. So humans muddle along and they get through the day and their stressors keep coming back into their conscious thought because they continue to stress and worry. 
a zebra doesn't worry about bills. A zebra doesn't worry about job loss or illness or divorce. Humans not only worry about things like that, events of the moment, but they also experience what I'm sure you all know is anticipatory stress. We stress about future events, don't we? We, we stress about the what ifs in life. Oh, what if this happens? What if that bill doesn't get there on time? What if I don't get the job? What if I find out that she doesn't like me? You know, what, all kinds of things we stress over. And we stress over these what ifs in life, even if they never happen. So this kind of chronic stress is absolutely not good for the body or the brain. It may not be possible to eliminate stress, but we do know that it is possible to manage our stress, to effectively manage our stress. And all of the brain health contributors that uh, Chelsea has mentioned are also things we can do to manage our stress, right? So we see that these brain health contributors really weave into each other. So we can reduce our stress by trying to eat better. We can manage our stress by exercising more. Some people say, I really, I like to go for a run if I'm stressed, or I really, walking keeps me from being stressed. S getting good sleep, drinking enough water, and doing other things like listening to music, um, laughing regularly, practicing mindfulness techniques. So that brings us to the next activity where I'm going to lead you through a mindfulness practice example. Now, I'm certain you've all heard of mindfulness. And if you haven't, mindfulness is a meditative practice of paying purposeful attention to the present moment. It is um, lovely. I've tried it. I've done it often. Sometimes I'll try to do it in traffic if I'm feeling stressed about getting home. I do live up here in Chicago. Um, but I'm going to take you through a mindfulness example uh, where you are going to become at your desks or wherever you are more mindful of noise, more mindful of the sounds around you. So I want you to listen to me, of course, because I'm going to lead you through the mindfulness activity, but I want you to reach beyond my voice and I want you to listen to sounds around you. Now, I would like you, if you aren't already, to have your feet flat on the floor. If you're standing, I want you to sit. <laughs> I want you to have your hands resting in your laps. I want you to close your eyes. I want you to first take a breath in through your nose, a deep breath in through your nose, and exhale it slowly through your mouth. Try that one more time. Take a deep breath in through your nose. Exit slowly through your mouth. Now I want you to listen to all of the noises that surround you. I want you to select a specific sound among the noises in your environment. So Pay attention to one of the sounds, if there are more than one sound, if there is more than one sound. Is this sound loud or soft? What direction is the sound coming from? Is the sound inside your location or outside? Is the sound close to you or is it at a distance? Is the sound intermittent or is it ongoing? Is the sound soothing? Is 
Have you heard this sound before? Can you easily identify what the sound is? Okay, take a deep breath in through your nose and let it out slowly through your mouth. One more time, a deep breath in through your nose and out slowly through your mouth. Okay, if you were going along with me, open your eyes. I probably would do this more slowly if I was before you and could actually see, get a reaction back from everyone else. It's hard to do that on webinar, but um, I hope you did notice the sound around you and it does, that is what mindfulness is, paying attention and purposeful attention in the moment. Sometimes when Chelsea and I are teaching other types of family life programs, and if we are teaching a mindfulness concept, sometimes we do a mindfulness to food or mindfulness to eating concept, where we give everyone a Hershey's kiss and we have them you know, use sensory, uh, use their senses as well. So touching the Hershey's kiss, paying attention to its shape, holding the Hershey's kiss in one's hand, smelling the kiss through the foil, then slowly opening it up, smelling it again, placing it in, placing it in one's mouth and letting it melt and the sensations of that. So you can actually practice mindfulness with all kinds of different things. So at this point, we would also direct our participants to think in terms of assessing their own relationship with stress reduction or stress management. In the, in the assessment, they would um, identify when they are stressed, what do they do about it? How do they manage it? Do they talk to someone? Do they exercise? Do they listen to music? Do they practice, practice some sort of relaxation exercise? So they would assess themselves and then of course, after assessment, we have them make some kind of plan. So based on this personal stress assessment, what are they going to do? Do they have a stress routine, management routine that works for them already? Or are they going to try perhaps one of the stress management strategies we, we talk about in the class? So moving on next, we're going to go to the fifth. Hey, Molly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Before we move on, there was a question about prolonged chronic stress. Um, so I just want to jump in real quick. Um, sure. So one thing about chronic stress, so um, when you think about high levels of stress, so your body really needs to recover from stress. So like if somebody, like in the example of like the zebra and the lion, you know, like you are running on all those like, you know, cortisol is flaring and your body's all in that high state of arousal. So, you know, different things spike our, our stress, you know, hormones and things. And if we don't have something to take us down from that, you know, we're not being chased by lions day to day, but it could be, you know, uh, work stress or we're, you know, caregiving or we're have financial stress or maybe, um, you know, something else is going on in our life. If we don't have ways to recover and to kind of come down from that heightened state, like um, Molly just mentioned, you know, like exercise or um, talking to somebody or some way to like kind of bring that down, um, like in the interim to have like a recovery period, that's when it's considered that chronic stress where you're like at heightened for a long time. Like, and it's so important because they say even like four months of chronic stress is unhealthy for your body and brain. And so, I mean, I see that you put like five years, 10 years, it really is like, like four months is cumulatively bad for you. So it is a lot less than like we think. So um, it is really important for us to like intervene in lives much quicker than what we think it is. Cause I mean, it's bad, you know, a month at a time. So, um, you know, it's, stress is really terrible for us and it actually does change things in our brain and um, has that, you know, impact on our bodies. So um, it's important for, 
just intervene. So yeah, so it's a good, really good question. I know that um, when we teach caregivers about caregiver uh, self-care, yeah. uh, we talk about stress and, you know, sometimes you don't even realize how stressed you are until your situation changes. Mm -hmm. And in the midst of caregiving, I would tell caregivers in the audience, and you know, if you teach caregivers, you know, sometimes there are very few caregivers in an audience because they're caregiving and they don't have time to come to a program. But what I would say to them is to find time each day that's just for you. Yeah. And that's really important. Even if it's 20 minutes, half an hour each day, find time just for you and practice managing that stress. Even if it's a cup of cup of coffee with a friend or a cup of coffee by yourself and you're flipping through a magazine just to regroup and find mm -hmm. that time for yourself. Yeah. Yeah, we have a professor here, Dr. Erica Tiemann, who does a lot of um, research on stress and recovery and body recovery, and um, it's really fascinating. So, mm -hmm. thank you. And um, I like your comment about wars, violent living situations, disasters, long recovery for some people, some situations, absolutely. Okay, um, now I will move on to the next brain health contributor, and that is having social connections, having that social emotional support. And the Beatles are right. I, we do get by with a little help from our friends. Having social support is really important for brain health. And Chelsea and I have followed a lot of um, the research from Dr. Marion Diamond. Dr. Marion Diamond just died last year. She was a former professor of neuroanatomy at the University of California, Berkeley. And she has done a great deal of research. Her entire life was devoted to research related to uh, social enrichment, social connections, and intellectual stimulation. And, and she did a lot of her research in the lab with, with rats. Uh, but she talks about love as a significant brain health contributor. And what she means by love is that we need significant social interaction in life. And she isn't the only researcher. Obviously, this is uh, universally accepted research as far as social connections are important to humans. And, and she, in her research, talks about love from the standpoint of we need significance. We need significant relationships where we are challenged by others. We, are, we challenge others. We have these long-standing or short-standing relationships. She also talks about the basics of tender, loving care, kindness, touch, positive attention, all being very important. Dr. Claudia Cowis, another researcher, a neurologist at University of California, Irvine, identified the connection between the number of social contacts we have and our state of well-being. And she says in her research that there is quite a bit of evidence now that suggests that the more people we have contact with in our homes and outside of our homes, the better we do. So she says that even our contact, our, um, our contact with acquaintances, our contact with people we don't know very well are also an important part of our social network. So even though our social connections do not all carry the same weight, social connections are vital for all of us. Our social networks typically uh, consist of, of course, those that we are closest to, our spouse or partner, our children, our grandchildren, nieces, nephews, friends, siblings, whomever is part of that inner circle, our close social networks. And then we have Others that we see as acquaintances, um, maybe less intimate friendships, maybe the store cashier that we see weekly, the bank teller we see often. And then we have another circle of relationships where we might have relationships with people we don't know very well, but we also see every now and again, the garbage collector, maybe the neighbor five doors down where, um, I don't even know her name, but I wave to her every morning as I'm on my way to work and or I stop at the mailbox and say hello and how's your 
How is your family? How is everyone doing? But we really don't know each other that well. Sometimes, in fact, we see our informal community acquaintances more in a given week than we might see those closer to us, depending on our, our situation, our circumstances. We may have adult children who no longer live close by, or we may not see other family members as often, but these other contacts are also important for us. It is equally important for us to help those that we know who are maybe more homebound, may not get out as often, to help them also stay in the game of life and to stay socially connected. So I think that's really vital for us as humans to have those connections and help others have them as well. So when we talk to our participants, we ask them, how do you stay socially connected? And some of them will say, you know, well, my daughter is over a couple of days a week. I babysit her kids. Um, I've joined a book club. I've joined another social club. I'm very involved in my church. Uh, some people might say, you know, I make phone calls. I'm, I'm not a computer user. I, I call everyone. Other people might say, oh, I love to email or I'm on Facebook. So in whatever way, we need to make sure that we have uh, these social networks. I also talk about uh, with the older adults that we, we teach to cultivate social relationships, perhaps uh, with people from different generations, um, people from areas that you might not frequent. Maybe uh, you'll make friends with someone that you never thought you would be a friend with or to. So this adds diversity to our social networks. With that in mind, this next activity is one where we, in our groups, try to have people be socially together. The activity is called Great Minds Think Alike. So if we were in a class together, we would have you pair up into twos and the, the object of this little activity is to actually try to think like your partner. So today in this activity, you're going to try to think like me. So what I want you to do, you have your scratch paper in front of you. I want you to number your paper from one to 20. You see that there are two lines or two answers for each number. So number first of all, from one to 20. And you'll put down two answers per line. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say a random category 20 times. And when I say that category, I want you to try to think of the most obvious, the most common answer for that category. In other words, we're going to try to pick the most obvious answers to try to think alike. So as an example, the first category is flower. So you would write down two types of flowers that you think I might say. Go ahead and do it. Okay. Now I was thinking of a daisy and a rose. So if you said daisy and rose, daisy and or rose, we would get a point for each one or you would get a point for each one. And that is how this is going to go. I'm going to go through the categories first, and then I'm going to give you my answers and you give yourself a point for every answer that we have alike. I'm sorry, good question. Flower is F-L-O-W-E-R. So daisy and rose would be the answer. I'll try to pay attention to that if, if I come across that again, where it might be something else you're thinking of. Okay, so number two, get ready to answer. You're going to pick the two most common responses that you think I will also say. The category is U.S. coins. Types of U.S. coins. Put down two answers. Number three, the category is zoo animals. Zoo animals. I'm not going to give you much time to write down your answers. You'll have to think quickly. 
for the category is Great Lakes. Great Lakes. Category five is Southern States. Southern States. Six, Hobbies. Hobbies. Seven, ice cream flavors, ice cream flavors. Eight, types of trees, types of trees. Nine, musical instruments. trying to think like me, musical instruments. Ten vegetables, two types of vegetables. Eleven United States presidents, United States presidents. Twelve condiments, condiments. Thirteen is fruits, types of fruits. I think you might be biased with the next one. Fourteen universities, universities. Remember, you're trying to think like me, hint, hint. 15 childhood games. Two types of childhood games. 16 male singers. Two male singers, performers. 17, two candy bars, candy bars. 18, two girls' names that begin with the letter N as in Neptune. Nineteen, two household appliances, two household appliances. And twenty, two European countries, two European countries. Now I'm going to give you my response. It just dawned on me that generationally, <laughs> we may think differently. You don't know how old I am. You don't know much about me, but um, based on geography, we might have different answers. I've never done this remotely, so this will be interesting, but all in all, we're trying to think alike. So here are my answers. Give yourselves one point for every answer that you have that is also what I have. My answers for one, flowers, I had daisy and rose. Two coins, I had nickel and dime. Zoo animals, I have giraffe and elephant. Great lakes, I have Michigan and Erie. Southern states, I have Florida and Georgia. Hobbies, I have reading and gardening. Ice cream, chocolate and vanilla. Trees, maple and oak. Instruments, piano, guitar. Vegetables, corn, peas. 
U.S. Presidents, Washington, Lincoln. Condiments, ketchup, and mustard. Fruits, apples, and bananas. Universities, you know, of course, U of I, University of Illinois, and then I also have Purdue. Childhood games, hopscotch, jump rope. Two male singers, Michael Jackson and Prince. Now you can probably tell what generation I'm from. <laughs> Two candy bars, Snickers and Hershey bar. Two girls' names, Nancy and Nora. Two household appliances, washer, dryer. And two European countries, Ireland and England. So go ahead and give yourselves a point for every answer that you have that is like mine. Okay, how did we do? Put your numbers in the chat box. We could have had up to 40 that were the same. All right, 20, excellent. I will tell you that I've done this with other groups, so is Chelsea, and 16, 17, 18 is typically the response that we get. So 21, you are a scholar. <laughs> That is higher than we usually get. All right, it's a nice little activity for people to do to compare answers. We have them do it quietly by themselves and then compare answers with each other. And it, it brings up a, a nice little laugh and people you know, socialize with each other. That was the whole point of the activity. So the next, or um, I guess I should tell you, as far as the assessment and plan that we do with this group after the activity, we have them first think about their social networks. We have them, it says, I would consider these individuals as part of my close social network. So they have a chance to say, you know, Mary is, um, I can count on Mary and Mary counts on me. And they have a chance to actually list people within their network. And then they just do a little assessment to, or their plan, they can either change their, the number of, um, make a plan to change their number of contacts by trying to increase, or they can identify that they're happy with their, the number of people in their lives, or they can try to reach out to make more social connections. So um, just really a little um, self-assessment food for thought about where they are in their lives in relation to their lives with others. So the last brain health contributor we're going to talk about is intellectual challenge. And that is challenging our brains with newness, doing new things, variety, a variety of new things, and increasing the level of difficulty. So current research does show that challenging the brain is also very important. And I'm, I know I'm not telling you anything new. So in challenging the brain, one of the things that we tell our audiences that is vital is when you do try new things, when you want to challenge yourself, do something that you've been wanting to do or that you think you'll like doing. Now, learning an instrument or learning a new language, wonderful challenge for the brain. Uh, but if you don't think you want to do either of those two things or you're not interested or don't have the capacity for those two things, maybe you don't have a piano to practice with, try something that you think you'd enjoy. Now, if you have no desire to read War and Peace, don't pick up War and Peace to read simply because you know it'll be a challenge. So you're, you're more likely to stick with something if you think you'll like it. Now, there is a difference between a mental activity and a mental challenge, just as there is a difference between a physical activity and a physical challenge. Washing the dishes is a physical activity, isn't it? Or dusting the table is a physical activity. While biking three times a week 
and committing to that might be more of a physical challenge if I use those as examples in my life. As far as a mental activity versus a mental challenge, if I sat in our living room and watched the birds outside on our front lawn and our trees and our flowers, that is more of a mental activity. If I wanted to research birds that are native to Northern Illinois, that would be more of a mental challenge for me. So another hint is if you've become very good at a chosen activity or maybe intellectual activities that you take part in all the time, it's important to take it up a notch and try to make the activity or the what you are doing more challenging. For instance, if you're a wonderful knitter or crocheter and you can make a blanket in no time at all and you are you have a couple of patterns that you go to all of the time and you're very good at it, you can do it practically without thinking about it, um, then you need to think, what can I do to challenge myself more? Try a pattern that you've shied away from. Try making a sweater or something else instead of a blanket, something that would be more difficult. So challenging our brain with newness, with novelty or variety, with increasing difficulty. We need to increase that difficulty so that we make that, um, so that we break that mental sweat, so that we actually feel like we're learning something new. We're, it's almost uh, so difficult at first that we're not sure we want to do it, but we keep at it, we master it, and then we move on to something else. That is wonderful for the brain, that true learning. So this activity is called states. And you see on the screen, M, N, and a question mark. If you, uh, at your, on your scratch paper, you don't have to number one to eight, but you're, what you're going to do is the word states stands for eight states. We, we combined the word, the two words into one word. So what we want you to do, we're going to give you maybe three, two, three minutes, and you're going to identify eight U.S. states that begin with the letter M, as in Molly, eight U.S. states that begin with the letter N, as in Nancy, and then there are eight states where each state is the only state that begins with a given letter. So there are eight individual states where that state is the only state that begins with that particular letter. I hope that's clear to everyone, so go ahead, think of eight states that begin with M, eight states that begin with N, and eight states that stand alone. They are the only state that begins with that given letter. Go ahead.
about 30 more seconds. Okay, let's come back together. Now, if, if we were really together in a classroom, I would probably give a little bit longer because uh, Chelsea and I have experimented with these activities we've created and it does take quite a bit of time to negotiate. How many does this have? How many? I, I can't think of the last one. So uh, I will give you the answers. You may already have eight, eight and eight, but I'll give you the answers anyway for those that don't. Eight states that begin with M. Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, Missouri, Minnesota, Mississippi, Montana. I have Missouri listed twice here, Charles. One, two, three, four, five, six. Michigan. I'm Michigan, Michigan. Is the thing. Yes. Yeah. Michigan. Um, We'll have to correct that on the, the script, Charles. Um, so Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, Missouri, Michigan, Minnesota, Mississippi, and Montana. Eight states that begin with N, Nebraska, Nevada, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York, North Carolina, and North Dakota. Now those two sets of eight states are a given. It's pretty finite. There's 8M and there's 8N. Now the third category is more difficult because you have to think of a state that doesn't have any other, where there isn't any other state that begins with a given letter. So those states are Delaware, there are no other Ds, Florida, Georgia, Hawaii, Louisiana, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, and Utah. Delaware, Florida, Georgia, Hawaii, Louisiana, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, and Utah. Okay, so I hope that helped you break a little bit of a mental sweat. It is something that, it's a, the type of activity that is absolutely doable. And what you are doing is you are recalling information from your long-term storage space into your conscious thought. And in aging, recall the ability or the difficulty in recalling information, that tip of the tongue feeling is one of the most normal noticeable changes associated with memory and aging where recall slows. So we do incorporate all kinds of various little recall activities to work on that. Chelsea started the program today by having you recall sayings for sleep. You are doing recall activities there as well. So these are nice little activities because they are things that you have to search your, your brain for for the answers, but they are answers that you do potentially know. So in closing, we talked today about the importance of taking care of our brains and what we can do to help contribute to the health of our brains throughout life. We did identify six brain health contributors. So now in the chat box, just as a fun little test, write down the brain health contributors. And I don't care if people write at the same time, we'll just have you keep writing until we see all six. So go ahead and write down the contributors that you remember we talked about today. Exercise, sleep, excellent. Diet, yes. Exercise, sleep, diet. So there are three more. Social connections, beautiful. Managing our stress and challenging our brains, great. You got them. You got them in no time at all. Um, can you name now additional factors that you think also contribute to brain health? or they do from you, or things that you know as far as changes we can make that will contribute to our brain health. 
or things that we can incorporate if we're not making change as far as reducing something we might incorporate something into our lives to help with brain health anybody write in the chat box great creative absolutely. writing absolutely absolutely creative writing art If I were to write one, I would say laugh more because I really do think humor helps. Volunteering, absolutely. Dancing, great. Vaca oh, vacation, <laughs> travel, <laughs> sure. Puzzles, wonderful. We had eating chocolate on our list. We might be a little biased there, but eating <laughs> chocolate trying a new hobby, maintaining a healthy weight. If a person smokes, maybe start thinking about cutting back on smoking, uh, getting treatment for anything going on in our physical bodies or our minds, um, going to the doctor if something is bothering us physically, going to the doctor if we're having trouble with anxiety or worry or stress. So all of these things are important brain health contributors. In this, uh, in the self-assessment, we do ask our participants to write down how they intellectually challenge themselves, to write down all of the th things they do that they think are challenging. I lead an ongoing brain health camp type of group called Wits Fitness. And when we get together twice a month, I always start by asking, what have you done in the last two weeks that you would consider intellectually challenging? And they say all kinds of things. You know, I balanced the checkbook. I had a difficult conversation with my child about something. They, they talk about all kinds of things from life. So the assessment asks you, you or the participant to write down how they challenge themselves intellectually. And then their plan includes uh, something that they want to try in the next 60 days that is new for them. So a little goal setting for each one of the contributors. And that is it. I'll turn it back over to Chelsea. All right. We're going to come back to questions in just a moment. I'm going to do a quick commercial here. Um, the next two sessions are going to be Fit Wits, which talks about the brain, kind of the regions of the brain, normal aging changes that happen um, with the brain. And then the other session of the three-part uh, brain health series is called Hold That Thought. That covers different types of memory, how memory changes and techniques to help with that everyday forgetfulness. Uh, oftentimes people say, you know, I can't remember where I put my keys and I walk into a room and I can't remember what I walked into that room for. And so we kind of cover that kind of memory um, and then talk about, you know, that tip of the tongue feeling like, oh, what was I just going to say and why can't I remember people's names? Um, so that's the focus of Hold That Thought. Um, this program was brought to you by the North Central Region Aging Network. Um, we're a group of uh, educators through Extension who all have kind of a gerontology focus. Um, but we also have future programs that are going to be on the first and third Fridays of every month beginning next month. So um, Molly and I are doing this in September, you know, the first three Fridays, but beginning in October, um, the first Fridays of each month is going to have a gerontology focus. The third Friday of the month is going to be on um, professional development. So it could be something about evaluation. It could be something about program planning. It could be something about learning how to, you know, improve your elevator speech. Um, you know, it could be personal development as well. So just something more um, general topic wise. So check that out as well as we're doing our soft launch on our website. So you can check us out at www.incran.org. Um, more information will be up there, but the website is live and we will have archived um, webinars on the um, website. So if you look at this uh, sheet here on the screen, you can see where it says webinar. If you go to that webinar tab, you will find the webinars. Um, so go check out our website. There's a place where you can subscribe and as we send out information, we can kind of do email blasts when something's coming up. Um, there's a blog, you can kind of see what's coming up for um, NCREAN. Uh, go learn more about our wonderful group. Uh, there is a representative from each of the North Central states. 
um, and wonderful colleagues in this group. So now we will go back to questions. Um, one of the questions was asked about getting materials. Um, we do have some work to kind of uh, fine tooth how we want to figure out how to disseminate the materials. Um, we still need to package it. We've just been delivering the programs here in Illinois. Um, and so sharing the materials hasn't been something we've done before with the Brain Health series. So um, we probably are not really going to be ready to share them until after the um, first of the year. So um, let me, don't get sick, I'm going to scroll through a lot of these real quick. If you're interested in um, getting information on the Brain Health series, um, if you will send me an email, it would be the best way for me to gather your information. So Chelsea Byers Gerstenecker, send me the email at clbyers at illinois.edu. And once we are um, ready to uh, ship this out to people, that would be the best way for us to have your information on our radar. Um, there will probably be just a nominal fee for um, some, you know, copying and shipping of the curriculum. Um, so uh, heads up on that, but um, it will not be um, exorbitant. So, <laughs> um, but so, but we hope to have that out like after the first of the year. Um, we We've also designed the curricula so that there isn't a lot of gathering of materials on the part yeah. of the facilitator. Um, that's why a lot of the the activities are paper and pencil, or they might be at your place activities that are a little bit physical. We also have taught older adults for a long time, so there isn't a lot of getting up and getting moving. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's hard to talk about exercise and then not get up and do any kind of exercise, but we purposely do that because we don't necessarily want people getting up in our groups and, and doing, you know, from the standpoint. Yeah. Um, one of these sessions used to have a whole bunch of things you had to gather. We had a, a, a different um, a video you had to show, and we had um, a game where you had to gather a whole bunch of materials to do it. It was a linking game, and so we kind of took out those activities and redesigned some of the activities. So take some of that um, uh, the material stuff out of the activities, um, just so to make it easier, make it easier on all the people delivering it. Um, but. Uh, let's see. So now we'll open it up for questions that you guys have. I think those are the only ones that we didn't answer during this session. Um, we've been delivering this, um, the, the one of the sessions since 2008, just for some historical um, perspective on it. Um, And then the other ones have been de developed since then, and then all of the research has been updated, so. We've individually been teaching brain health in Illinois since about 04. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been teaching this series since about 08. This is Christy from Michigan, and I wondered if you always present all three of the sessions. Great. As a series, or if you um, can also separate them based on whatever the interest is of the group. Great question. They're all standalone, so no. Um, oftentimes we deliver just one. So um, if an organization is just looking for a single session, um, we will just deliver one. Um, so another way to do it. So a couple different ways of delivery. Um, you can deliver them singly. Um, you can package them as a three-part series. Um, and often I, I partner with the Alzheimer's Association and make it a four-part series. And they come in and deliver um, a session on knowing the 10 signs of Alzheimer's or um, Alzheimer's basic. Um, and I know Erin delivered an Alzheimer's 101 last May through the NCRAN group that would be available also to make it, you could package, you know, if you took that lesson, you could do it yourself. Um, I just know I always try to partner with our local Alzheimer's Association to come in and be a partner in it. Um, from my previous history with working at the Alzheimer's Association, people sometimes don't want education on Alzheimer's and because they're afraid of it. Um, 
until it's too late or because they don't want to know the information because it's scary to them. And so coming to a brain health series to promote keeping their brains engaged, it's like, oh, it's part of the series. I'll go learn the information. And it's really well received. And so um, she comes in, um, our, my partner comes in and does the, the Know the Ten Signs. And I usually put it in the middle, like at like session two or three. So then it's kind of couched in the middle and then people can ask questions and it's like non-threatening. It's like, I, I'm not going to the Alzheimer's program. I'm going to, I'm going to empower my brain, brain health session. Um, and then they learn about it and it's kind of snuck in there. Um, and so uh, it's been a great partnership that way. Um, so just kind of just throwing that out there. If you um, want to reach out to somebody or teach the Alzheimer's 101 yourself and, you know, do a four part series, that's also a great way to do it. Um, just because, again, sometimes people are like, I don't want to know about that, that's scary, but um, we found that really successful to get people to learn about it and to know the 10 signs in a non-threatening way. There is also, uh, there are single evaluations for each one of the sessions. The session, the three sessions together we've titled as a theme, Brain Health is a No-Brainer. But of course, each session has its own title and its own, its own topic. So each session has its own retrospective evaluation tool that accompanies it. And we did win the Florence Hall Award. I don't remember what year that was, Molly, for the three-part series. So that I think yes. whatever my, whatever your Montana was <laughs> at NAACS for the, the series, which is really a coup. So we're pretty proud of it for being, um, you know, going out there and doing the brain health because it's a little bit different for um, FCS. So. We've also given a lightning talk at our own annual conference for all of Extension about the topic of brain health and what we've been doing within uh, family life team in this area across the state of Illinois. And that was also a, a, neat, a neat and here I talked about stress, stressful experience to do a lightning talk, but it was good for the noggin to do it as well. We were definitely on and in focus. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, thank you everybody for chiming in. Again, you can reach us at our emails. Um, again, if you're interested, shoot me an email and I will just keep a spreadsheet of those. And then um, once it's ready to shoot out, I will send everybody a email to say how to get that. Um, we just need to figure out how the best way is through our online system, set that up and get it moving. And as you all know, working with the universities, it doesn't always happen immediately or what that system's gonna look like for us. So, um, Thank you for chiming in today. Uh, have a great weekend. And uh, it's pretty wet here in Illinois, so I don't know what it's looking like in your neck of the woods, but have a great weekend. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.